So, yes. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Somya Deep. And today I'm going to talk about uh, asymptotically optimal adversarial strategies for the probability estimation framework. Um, the probability estimation framework was developed by Manny Kamel, Yan Bao Zhang, and Peter. Uh, when I guess Peter was working at NIST. So the probability estimation framework uh, is associated with device independent quantum randomness generation. And quantum randomness generation exploits uh, this fact that there are quantum correlations of measurement outcomes that cannot be accounted for uh, by any deterministic side entity having some side information. Um, and in this work, we consider classical side information, so the adversary is not quantum capable. Um, so the framework has, uh, so it can be seen as a schematic Bell experiment. I mean, in this diagram, we have two parties, usually named Alice and Bob, but this framework is applicable for any number of parties. Um, so we perform trials and an experiment uh, is, uh, consists of n number of trials and corresponding to every trial, we have inputs X and Y for Alice and Bob and outputs A and B for Alice and Bob. We use this abbreviated notation uh, Z for inputs and C for outputs. And the whole experiment consists of a sequence of N trials. We structure them as a sequence of random variables, Z for inputs and C for outputs. And the framework has a notion of model which is really a set of distributions of inputs and outcomes, uh, admissible set of distributions which would follow constraints like no signaling or quantum or even local. Um, so what probability estimation framework primarily does is assign scores to trial results. So a higher score imply more randomness. And uh, this is in spirit of the so-called the entropy accumulation framework um, in the sense that the, the estimates, the trial-wise estimates sort of accumulate multiplicatively and we, we estimate the, the, the conditional probability of the sequence of outcomes conditioned on inputs. So more formally, a probability estimation framework with positive power uh, is a non-negative function of the inputs and outputs. Uh, which are modeled as random variables, taking values in this alphabet, C and Z, such that this expectation condition is satisfied. And when this is satisfied for all distributions in the model, we say that F is a PEF for the model. Now, the probability estimation framework involves um, es direct estimation of the conditional probabilities of obtaining outcomes conditioned on settings so this inequality basically says that with very high probability, the, the product of the trial-wise PEFs, obviously multiplied by some er error tolerance and the whole thing is raised to the power of negative one over beta, uh, serves as an upper bound uh, to the conditional probability of the outcomes conditioned on settings uh, you know, with a very high probability where each FI is the probability estimation factor of the ith trial. Now, uh, a generic randomness generation protocol uh, is tasked with extracting near uniform random bits uh, from the raw outputs, in this case, the outputs of a Bell experiment. And one of the first tasks is to actually certify the amount of randomness in, in the raw outputs. And we do that by by establishing a lower bound on smooth conditional mean entropy. So the, the definition of smooth conditional mean entropy that we're using is by Renato Renner and Stefan Wolf. This is from very early work, I think 2005. So basically it says that the smooth conditional mean entropy is the maximization of the the main entropy, which is like negative log of the guessing probability. But according to their definition, if you notice this sigma, which is a non-negative function of the sequence of uh, random variable C and Z is dominated by distribution 
while being within epsilon L1 norm. And we know that uh, the, the, the notion of dom dominance is, is only if uh, this is a sub probability distribution, right? So it cannot be a distribution. So, and we don't want that because it's, you know, uh, in subsequent slides, you'll see that we are only dealing with distributions that are within epsilon L1 norm of the distribution of interest, which is new. So we note that, you know, in order to have distributions in this B epsilon set, uh, just, just note that, uh, you know, alternatively, we can look at the smooth conditional min entropy maximization, this maximization as a maximum value of lambda such that the sigma CZ is bounded by two to the negative lambda mu Z. We can define a sub probability distribution uh, as shown, which is less than or equal to two to the negative lambda. And we know that lambda, even maximum lambda is always bounded by log of uh, the cardinality of the set of sequences. And that's because, you know, mean entropy is less than or equal to conditional Shannon entropy, which is less than or equal to this. And so two to the negative lambda is at least this much. So there is a lemma which I did not include, which basically allows us to form distribution from this sub probability distribution. And then we can multiply mu of z. And throughout, we have assumed that the z is in the support. So z is occurring with positive probability. And so we can multiply mu of z to the conditional probability distribution that we have formed. And then basically, we have formed a distribution of cz within epsilon L1 norm. Intuitively, what this means is that if you view a distribution as a bar plot, if you only come down from it, then you can build up in a different way to a distribution while being within L1 norm uh, from, from me. So, uh, okay. All right, so as I said earlier, that probability estimation uh, consists of uh, establishing these upper bounds on the conditional probabilities with very high probability. So this P of mu really means this, uh, this the probability of this event occurring. If we define this event that product of the trial wise PEFs is less than or equal to some predetermined P, which has to be at least this much, and this condition can be thought of as you know, the, the protocol passing. Uh, if this product is greater than P, then the protocol is aborted. And uh, kappa is, is a lower bound on the probability of the protocol passing. So then the, the following holds. So this is a lower bound on the smooth conditional mean entropy. And so next, um, so the previous two theorems do not tell us how to obtain PEFs. So a way to do that is to consider a generic trial distribution and perform this maximization. Um, just going back to the previous slide. So if we take, uh, so this is the condition for the protocol passing. If we take negative you know, log of both sides and make some adjustment and asymptotically, what we get is this expectation with respect to a trial distribution, which can be you know, based on observed results and calibrations from previous trials. So we perform this maximization and the satisfiability constraints apart from the PEF being non-negative is that this condition is satisfied for all distributions in the model, which can be computationally infeasible because there could be so many distributions. And so we have this lemma that basically says that if the PEF condition is satisfied at two distributions, then it is also satisfied at any distribution that is obtained as a convex combination of the two. And, but there is an assumption. We, we assume this model to be convex and closed. If not, we, we take the convex closure of it. So then uh, this first line of constraints can be replaced with all distributions uh, in, the, in the extremal set. 
All right, so the proof of, uh, the way we prove this lemma is, is very direct and short and simplified. In the original paper, it, it is done analytically. We do it algebraically. Uh, but, you know, it involves showing joint convexity of this. Uh, we can look at it as a special case of sandwich for any powers, um, which is joint convexity of this functional, where the distribution omega is defined in this in this fashion. Now, <clears throat> this is also a special case of a, of a more general quantum case, which was proven by Rupert Frank and Elliot Lee. I think it's a 2011 result. 2013, 2013 yeah. Yeah, so the, the year on archives is 2013. So, so they have this proposition. Um, yeah, so this functional is jointly concave, but we don't care about it. We are only interested in joint convexity for alpha greater than one. Now, in our case, the order of the, the Rennie divergence, and this is classically Rennie divergence, by the way, uh, is, is greater than one for beta positive because one plus beta is the order. So if you look at this functional, these rho and sigma are density states. And they showed that this is jointly convex for alpha greater than one. Now, if we take register states and register states are basically probabilistic states, then sandwiched Rennie divergence reduces to classical Rennie divergence, which is then this. Um, so, but yeah, that's, that's just an observation. And by the way, Mark, you brought this to our notice in one of our meetings. I think you don't remember this from last year. I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, sorry, since you call her. Um, to quote Mike Mislow, aren't you using an elephant gun to kill a mosquito? Like, th this is a classical ready relative entropy. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need the quantum <coughs> thing. You can just use joint convexity of the classical ready relative entropy, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the, we did not even use that. that actually. Special case. All right. Yeah. Yeah, this is just to show that it's it's really a special case that we did not really uncover anything new. It was all done, understood, and we we do not even use the the joint convexity of classical Rennie divergence. It's uh, even more elementary than that. It's it really is based on the fact that if uh, we have two joint distribution, uh, the the convex mixture of that. Uh, I mean, if we have a convex mixture of two joint distribution, then the conditional distribution can also be. Uh, obtained as a complex mixture of the respective conditional distributions. So, um, yeah. Uh, but, so next, uh, we look at the asymptotic performance of the probability estimation framework and the adversarial attack that we are considering here is so-called IIV attack. So we are structuring the the, the outcomes of the experiment, the settings, and deep side information as a sequence of random variables. And it's IID, so it's basically product over the individual trial distributions. Also, uh, these omega of CI, ZI, EI belongs to a set of strategies. And what we mean by strategies is that it's a distribution such that conditional on each Eve's uh, the value realized by a random variable, basically a side information, this belongs to the model and it marginalizes to the observed trial statistics. So Eve is trying to generate the trial statistics. So yeah, but that's like just an attack. The optimal attack is so each strategy is to generate as little randomness as possible. One measure of randomness is the conditional Shannon entropy. So she wants to generate as little randomness as possible and hence her optimal attack would be the infimum of this. Overall strategy is basically uh, joint distributions that <clears throat> belong to the model of distributions conditional on her side information and also marginalized to the trial statistics. Um, later we show that this H min, this quantity, is an upper bound on the smooth conditional mean entropy rate. Now, this infimum 
can be achieved. And there is a distribution in the set of strategies uh, such that this infimum is, is achieved at some mu. And uh, this was actually an improvement uh, from the previous result. The previous result said that it's uh, Eve only needs to have finitely many symbols as her size information, and that it's two plus the dimension of the model. But uh, we managed to reduce it to one plus, I mean, one fewer than the symbols that she needs, which is, I guess, not a huge improvement, but improvement nonetheless. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm sorry, this is very cluttered, but uh, yeah, I'll just try to explain everything. So the, the H min, which, which was this infimum, we know that it's achieved. So that's uh, corresponding to some mu, let's say. And that acts as an upper bound to the smooth conditional entropy and uh, the smooth conditional min entropy. And this characterizes the number of uh, new uniform random bits that we can generate. And uh, so, and later we will show that this is the amount of randomness that we can asymptotically certify using PEFs. So the, the big picture is that we can certify all the randomness that, that there is in, in the outcomes. Uh, so, the, so the theorem states that, and uh, just to mention that, uh, exactly this theorem is there in uh, Marco Tomo Michel's book, Quantum Information Processing with Finite Resources. There he phrases this as the converse of AEP, asymptotic AP partition property. Um, but we did not really use a, a special case of the quantum, quantum proof. Uh, our, our approach is quicker and more straightforward. We, we are really appealing to the AEP condition written here. So um, basically, for very large n, the average conditional maximum probability defined as shown is at least this much, where gamma is two to the negative n times the conditional Shannon entropy minus n delta. And uh, the, the AP, the proof really involves these, these two things. First, we, we suppose that uh, with very high probability in expectation, uh, this conditional probability of the outcomes conditioned on ZE is at least this gamma, which is which is one over two to this thing. And then again, we define a set and this time it's a set of distributions that is within epsilon L1 norm uh, and not sub to distribution. And that is accounted for by the lemma that I discussed earlier. And second, we define this set, which is which basically says that I mean, this set is all those uh, sequence of outcomes corresponding to you know, ZE with positive probability such that the conditional probability is at least gamma. And then using some elementary arguments, we can show that this condi average conditional maximum probability is at least this, and this holds for all such sigma in this set. And then it follows that basically we're taking the negative log that this condition holds. So, I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Just to clarify some things. So, H mu is Shannon entropy of the distribution. Yeah, the mu. true true conditional Shannon entropy. Yes. Okay. And yes. then, can you remind what epsilon A, epsilon F is? Yeah, epsilon A is uh, this error probability for the AP condition. Epsilon S is the smoothing parameter, the, the smoothing set. Yeah. So is, is it related to like security of the protocol? Uh, they they are related only like by this technical condition that it has to be less than one, but uh, no, it's it's not clear. Uh, it's, it's just there. They could be dependent on each other, but they might not be. Um, okay. So this H min quantity basically quantifies how well Eve can do. And, and next we we show that PEFs can can certify this much asymptotically for, for a trial. 
So now we are we are talking about entropy estimators, which are really again uh, non-negative real functions. Oh no, not non-negative. Sorry, functions of inputs and outputs such that this condition holds, and this upper bound on like uh, on the right hand side is the condition of Shannon entropy, basically. So so far we were talking about PEFs, probability estimation factors, and now suddenly entropy estimator. The, the, the connection is this: the PEFs of this form satisfy this condition, which is basically the definition of entropy estimator. So we don't really need to look for separate functions uh, as entropy estimators. The, the PEFs really suffice. Um, so the theorem that that says that uh, using PEFs, we can we can certify this much is this that we have an entropy estimator and uh, we're really not a not an entropy estimator but really a family of entropy estimators and uh, an observed distribution then the PEF whose asymptotic log prob rate now uh, log prob rate is something that I I did not define. Um, let me go back to so log prob rate is n times log of this PEF divided by beta, the whole thing divided by n. So it's like a per trial expectation of the log of PEF divided by beta. And that's uh, really a figure of merit for randomness generation. If it's positive, then we say that, it, that uh, the PEF corresponding to that distribution generates randomness. Okay, so one thing we considered, which was not uh, considered in the previous uh, two PEF papers was robustness. So if we maximize uh, PEF corresponding to a distribution rule, then how far do we have to go from that distribution in statistical distance while still generating randomness? And, uh, so this condition sort of establishes that um, and assuming that, so this script O is, is the log prob rate, the, the figure of merit that I just mentioned. Um, assuming that it's positive, that means the PEF generates randomness at row and a sufficient condition for it to have a non-negative log prob rate at a different distribution, which is some total variation distance away from row is this. So if the sigma is within this much total variation distance, then this is a sufficient condition for the PEF to have a positive log prob rate. So in other words, it generates randomness corresponding to that distribution. What is L max and L min? Oh yes, L max and L min is uh, the maximum of the log of the PEF over all inputs and outputs. And Elman is is like this. So uh, can I can I write down? Okay. So L max is the max. Likewise. So a corollary that immediately follows from 11 is that uh, the log prob rate is, is continuous in the sense that two distributions are within epsilon total variation distance, then this holds. So, yeah. um, okay, so next we look at some, some applications to the simplest uh, Bell scenario, which is the 2-2-2. Two, two, two. So we have two players, two measurement settings for each player and two outcomes corresponding to each setting. And again, uh, just to reca uh, recapitulate that, uh, the input is abbreviated as Z and the output uh, is abbreviated as C. And throughout, uh, we have considered uniform settings distribution. So these conditional distributions, as you're probably aware, are also known as boxes or behaviors. And so the distribution, the joint distribution of the settings and out outcomes is, is this, is defined as this. So we are only considering uniform uh, settings distribution. So again, to, to recap, the, for the 2 to 2 belt scenario, the no signaling uh, polytope is really a convex closure of these extremal distributions, or extremal boxes really. Uh, the eight 
PR boxes, Popescu Rolex uh, boxes, defined by Pethine and the 16 local deterministic boxes. Um, and yeah, the convex closure of these uh, forms the most significant polytope. And we are only considering the standard CHSH expression, which is this. And, uh, and we know that there are eight uh, tight bell inequalities, which basically form facets, delimiting the local polytope. We only consider the standard CHSH. And there's only one PR box that maximally violates this bell inequality. And there are eight among 16 LDs that uh, saturate it. And the set of distributions that we consider henceforth is uh, the, the set of distributions violating standard CHSH. And um, all right, so uh, one thing we noticed that a distribution arbitrarily violating standard CHSH has positive log prob rate. And this has been established by, I think, Asin, Lassar, and Peronia that. Uh, you know, non-locality, randomness, and entanglement are related sort of notions, but they don't really have a direct implication. A very high violation of a Bell inequality does not necessarily guarantee more randomness. So here we just provide an example that shows that something that arbitrarily uh, violates CHSH has positive log prob rate. So this probability table is an extremal quantum correlation, which maximally violates this tilted CHSH. Uh, T is a parameter that's greater than or equal to one. These plus plus, the plus and minuses are basically the, the outcome symbols and zeros and ones are the measurement settings. And uh, these Greek letters are as defined here. But uh, the, main, the main thing is that the, sta the, the corresponding standard CHSH violation is this. And so as T becomes very large, this value is only arbitrarily greater than two. But then we can define PEF with uh, K star defined as shown. And we observe that the log prob rate is this, which for large values of N approaches this, and this is positive for any T greater than or equal to one. Yeah, okay. Uh, next. Again, getting back to that optimal IID attack, uh, for the 2 2 2 bell scenario, we noticed that you know, the, the strategy that Eve has uh, is expressible as a convex sum of these, where mu E is some, some probability of a side information. And these distributions could be. Uh, they need to be nine, I mean, no more than nine. And they are one PR box and the eight local deterministic distribution that saturate the Bell inequality. And this is the PR box that maximally violates the standard CHSH. Um, yeah, so, and then this uh, really relies on a result that Peter proved in, in his 2016 paper that equal mixtures of PR boxes are expressible as equal mixtures of LDs. And, sorry, equal mixtures of two distinct PR boxes are expressible as equal mixtures of four distinct LDs. And a consequence of that is that uh, any correlation that violates a Bell inequality is expressible as a convex combination involving at most one PR box and no more than eight. Uh, local deterministic distributions that saturate the well inequality. Now, we have a strong suspicion that if we restrict our model to be the quantum correlations that violate standard CHSH, then likewise, you know, just, just as in the no signaling scenario, in the quantum scenario, her optimal, the, the eavesdropper's optimal strategy is one quantum extremal distribution that maximally violates standard CHSH, uh, denoted as sigma Q, and the eight LDs. Uh, we are not able to resolve this conjecture, although we have a strong suspicion. And this is because that a full characterization of the eight dimensional set of quantum correlation still eludes us. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that is not known. We have a characterization of the two-dimensional slice of it, 
but we don't have a full eight dimensional characterization. But uh, I mean, it'll be kind, kind of nice to have at least a, a three dimensional or a little bit higher dimensional characterization of the quantum correlations, but we don't have it right now. But uh, I mean, we have this feeling that it could be done using just uh, standard techniques from convex analysis, but yeah, I mean, we haven't been able to resolve it so far. So it's really a conjecture as of now. And um, Okay, that's it. So in conclusion, I will say that the probability estimation framework is a, is a powerful tool in certifying randomness in quantum non-locality experiments. It involves direct estimation of the conditional probabilities. And what we have done is really simplify some of the previous works on, on the other two PF, uh, PEF papers. And we have also done this analytic characterization of optimal adversarial attacks. So, Thank you for your attention. Maybe one really quick question. So, yeah. It's kind of a high level question. So suppose I'm a new graduate student entering this field. And I want to analyze like you know, the randomness or security of some device in kind of protocol. My understanding is that there are two different frameworks entropy accumulation and there's probable probability estimation framework. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are different but related. Is there like are the, what are the advantages of one over the other? Wh which one uh, um, would be like, <clears throat> easier to work with or like you know can you compare them or so I'd like to mention that uh, although in this work we are only considering the classical side information, but the quantum side information has been done for this same framework. Uh, the advantage, as I see it, would be you know entropy accumulation involves estimation of entropy, which is a characteristic of a distribution. But the probability estimation framework involves uh, direct estimation of the trial statistics, really, which is the outcomes and the input settings. Yeah. So that's that's so like ultimately you want to make some statement about like the trade-off of security and weight, right? Yeah. And these, uh, entropy accumulation allows you to do that, right? Right. Um, so like, does the probability estimation framework give you more fine-grained information about the reason like with this trial statistics? Um, um, one thing about this is that you find that in experiments of finite length, uh, this seems to be better, you know, like if you write billions and billions of trials, they both kind of converge to the same rate. Mm -hmm. But we just found that in practice, this seems to work better for like experiments of a few million trials that their uh, entropy accumulation framework, they have some decaying epsilon curves that decay slowly. They're not as well optimized. That's one practical difference. So, so like entropy accumulation would underestimate like the amount of random bits you could extract. Right. At least the way they were implementing it in an experiment, which is easy to do. So I don't know if they improved that, but uh, that was definitely um, one of the strong motivations for you know fleshing this out is to improve performance in finite number of trials. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Thank you.